Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Another former alderman has the dubious distinction of going to prison. No, there's no justice in this. I'm not happy about it. My family's not happy about it. But you know, the fact of the matter is, it's never going to be right, not under these circumstances. Former alderman Willie Cochran is sentenced to one year in prison for wire fraud. Cannabis legalization was really about justice and safety. Governor Pritzker signs Illinois' recreational marijuana bill into law. Um, I think there's a lot of good work that I can still do. Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle reverses on retirement plans and in sports. Prayers right now. That's all I really can control. A two-year-old girl struck by an errant foul ball at a Cubs game in Houston spurs the discussion about safety netting at Major League ballparks. Joining us tonight are Derek Blakely of CBS2 Chicago, Greg Hines of Crane's Chicago Business, A.D. Quigg of The Daily Line, and WBEZ contributor Cheryl Ray Stout. Let's get right to it. Derek Blakely, did Willie Cochran receive a fair sentence? I think he did. I mean, when you look at all the facts of the case, uh, Willie Cochran was a bizarre figure in this. Remember, he entered a guilty plea, which he then took back. Prosecutors allege only took it back so he could stay in the city council under indictment and continue to get paid. Then when he lost the election, he changed his plea back to guilty. He was very contrite in the courtroom. Then he gets outside the courtroom and blasts the whole process. Not a lot of consistency there. Not a lot of integrity there either. I can't keep track of all the different positions that he took. Greg Hines, is this going to send a message to future aldermen to keep your business clean? Well, uh, one would think so. Uh, the one would also have thought that any of the uh, dozens and dozens of aldermen who've gone down to uh, federal prison in the last 20 years would have also sent a message. But they still keep doing it. Uh, that's why uh, some of the things that Lori Lightfoot, our new mayor, is trying to do to uh, at least reduce the amount of temptations maybe will have an effect. A.D. Quigg, you were there at the sentencing. What did you make of Cochran's demeanor? It was contrite in the courtroom with the expectation that maybe he would get you know, six months of house arrest and maybe probation, but instead he got, you know, a year and a day, which is not what he wanted, not what he expected. He gets out of the courtroom and he's like, the whole thing was a sham. And uh, he'll surrender himself on August 23rd, and he's, you know, the 30th since the 70s to get convicted. And one of the big reasons the judge said he needs jail time is so he could send a message. And we have, you know, three aldermen who are under suspicious circumstances as we speak. It hasn't worked in the past. I'm not sure if these jail times work for others. Cheryl Ray Stout, as someone who lives in the suburbs, looking on in the city, you have three aldermen, as A.D. mentioned, under investigation, Willie Cochran going to jail. Do you believe it's an inflection point now and Chicago's going to clean up after this? Well, that's what the mayor wants to do, but can she? It seems like it's one of the things that you have to do when you're an alderman, it's commit a crime. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of the prerequisites. I ho hopefully not going <laughs> yeah, forward. Yeah, orange suit. Greg, uh, Greg Hines, we also learned this week that Kevin Quinn, the former uh, lieutenant, a top political lieutenant of Mike Madigan, had his house raided by the feds. What do you think they're looking at? Um, one could hope that they're looking at all kinds of juicy stuff. I don't know that. Um, uh, they haven't told us is the honest answer. Um, but they could be looking at internal stuff with Mike Madigan. They could be looking at stuff that just relates to him and his particular little enterprises. Um, I will say that uh, lots of people have thought that we're about to get the speaker, uh, Mr. Madigan, for a very long time, and it hasn't happened. So I'm yet to be, uh, I want to see the proof that they're really after him. And of course, Quinn was the guy that was accused of sexual harassment by the woman, Elena Hampton. A.D. Quigg, do you think that the feds are trying to perhaps get information out of him to lead to the bigger fish? I have no idea. This is the fun and terrible part of covering politics this way and covering what well, the feds... covering fe the feds. Covering the feds, they won't tell you gosh It's a big thing. guessing the, game. The Tribune seemed to suggest that it might have something to do with the wiretaps uh, of Alderman Danny Solis. There were some conversations they caught between Solis and some businessmen in Chinatown over a land deal there. We just have no idea. We might not know for months the same way we might not know what's going on with Carrie Austin. And there's also two federal court cases involving Madigan, one from Jason Gonzalez, the person who accuses Madigan of putting up sham candidates against him, and then from David Krupa, who ran against Marty Quinn, mm -hmm. who's Kevin Quinn's <coughs> brother, who, who uh, tried to revoke all the petition signatures. I'm sorry, everybody, no one can keep <laughs> track of all of this, but, the, but the, this is the reality of what's going on. Okay, so A.D. mentioned uh, Carrie Austin. Derek, do we know any more this week about what the feds are looking at with her. 
Well, there's been some suggestion that uh, they're looking at uh, uh, the deal behind the home where she lives in, the deal with the developer who got uh, uh, some kind of TIF assistance to help with that project, which she voted for, whether there's a connection there. That's been the suggestion. But uh, we really don't know yet because uh, uh, charges haven't been leveled yet. Uh, it seems on the surface, though, it is not directly connected. At least this is what we seems now with the whole Burke Solis investigation. But it's another powerful alderman. Uh, you know, under suspicion, we have Danny Solis, we had Ed Burke, we have Kerry Austin, who headed the three most powerful city council committees just a few months ago. And more to come, almost certainly. Yeah. And everyone's saying. Anyone want to name names? <laughs> no. no. No, but, but everyone's uh, saying they didn't do it. You know, everyone's. I'm completely oh, innocent. Well, they're all innocent. Yeah. Oh, Until they're not. Oh, 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 <laughs> Judge, they're I didn't not. mean it. Yeah, right. But what about Kerry Austin, Greg? Do you think it, uh, this investigation is limited to this possible home deal? Um, no. Um, I reported a while ago that uh, they're that they're looking at uh, campaign funding uh, and that the, the people who've gotten a hold of the, of the subpoenas. That's one of the things. Campaign disclosure records were were part of what they're looking at. Uh, but uh, but AD is right. We really don't know. They haven't told us. Uh, but uh, based on the Fed's track record in this town, when they do something like this, when they engage in a big public, uh, we're, we're going to get you, they got you. They were not discreet. So, A.D., does that mean that action on a potential indictment is going to come quick, like it did in the Burke case? We never know. It could be, it could be months. And it could play out like Willie Cochran. Once it does get to court for years, and that whole time, Carrie Austin could stay in office, keep collecting her aldermanic check. And what about the mayor's response to Carrie Austin? I mean, she's calling on Ed Burke to, to step down, but not so much with Carrie Austin. Right, because she hasn't been charged, and we don't exactly know what those charges are. So both, alder both aldermen, other aldermen in the Black Caucus and also Mayor Lightfoot, and President Preckwinkle, who's the head of the Cook County Democratic Party, have all said, we're going to reserve judgment until we know exactly it what those charges are. It is noting, though, that, uh, that uh, Mayor Lightfoot has a little exposure on this one, because uh, when she forced out Carrie Austin's head of the Budget Committee, she gave her another committee instead. So. She has a little bit of tarnish here, too, if, if Austin goes down. All right, Cheryl, there were some big Supreme Court decisions on gerrymandering mm -hmm. and the census. Uh, do you think that sort of the average voter gets the ramifications of these? I don't think so, um, because it doesn't seem to affect them until they see it. Something affects a, a ruling that, that's personal to them. So the, when it comes to political aspects, which is the gerrymandering, I don't think the, the average person knows. And, and it, it certainly doesn't affect them until the maps are redrawn. Greg Hines, how are the rulings on gerrymandering in the sense it's going to affect Illinois? Uh, this is about two things, Paris, money and power. Um, what the Supreme Court essentially said is you can gerrymander your heart's desire if you run the government. Well, in Illinois, that means that Mike Madigan and mm -hmm. John Collins, the president of the Senate, and J.P. Pritzker can do whatever maps they want in a couple of years, and there's no real legal prohibition. Uh, against at least based on uh, using political factors, it means Illinois is going to probably remain a one-party state indefinitely. I think people care about that; they just don't realize it. Uh, the, the money part of it comes into uh, in that uh, if if this preliminary decision uh, to not allow a question about citizenship remains, the odds are that more. Uh, more Hispanics in particular uh, and other immigrant groups will be counted. That, that means Illinois will have more people, so we'll get more federal money, and it means we will probably only lose one congressman in remap, not two. And Derek, Governor Pritzker issued a strong statement in support of the census decision, kind of a tepid statement on gerrymandering. I mean, he's called for drawing fair maps, but do you really believe the governor, whose party has all this power, wants to just give it up? Well, he's kind of caught between on that issue and there's a kind of a disconnect between local democrats and national democrats you've heard national democrats uh blasting the supreme court's decision on gerrymandering uh because across the country republicans control most state houses which means they draw the maps so it's it's a, a position national democrats are very strong on but of course locally democrats control not only chicago but they control the, the legislature in the entire state they don't want to give up that power, and they're not going to have to give it up. So uh, Governor Pritzker is kind of out on a limb on that. Uh, Mike Madigan's not going to not going to uh, return that that power that he has to draw that map, regardless of what Governor Pritzker says. A.D. Quigg, does this ruling mean that the entire country and the state of Illinois is stuck with politically drawn maps just in perpetuity? Unless they get some, you know brave heads of state who say, no, we're going to stick to this fair map thing, yes. And we're, it, it doesn't only apply to the state. We're going to see this play out when the city redraws their ward maps, when the county redraws their districts. It plays out over and over again. And there's not much 
forcing these leaders to change. And I don't think aldermen are going to be joining Lightfoot and saying, because Lightfoot's told you, we want an independent remap, and I don't think aldermen are going to hop on. There have been some citizen-led efforts uh, to, by initiative to change the rules, uh, places like Michigan and Ohio, but uh, Iowa, but uh, uh, when it comes to good government, Illinois is traditionally not a leader. Those places are, are had it. I'm not sure we're ready to catch up with them, like it or not. All right, Greg Hines, uh, you wrote today about Mayor Lightfoot's pension proposal. Is that good government, what she's proposing to do about the pension problem in Chicago? Well, it depends on your perspective. She essentially wants to pass the buck, almost literally. Uh, we face in the, we in the city of Chicago an additional billion dollars or so in additional pension payments we're going to have to come up with in the next three years. Um, most of the money would probably have to come out of the property tax. Our property tax is already skyrocketing in parts of the city. It'd be a real lift. So she wants to con pa essentially pass the problem on to the state, uh, consolidate the city's pension programs, as she's, uh, my resources tell me, along with uh, with uh, uh, pension programs that in, in the suburbs and downstate that in some cases are equally underfunded and have the state pick up the bill. Uh, one of the things that uh, her people are looking at is maybe we tax retirement income above a certain level, $100,000, $125,000 That's the year. third whale of Illinois politics, taxing retirement income. You know, it has been, but, uh, but this state and this city just cannot continue to duck this pension problem. It doesn't disappear if you ignore it. It gets worse. We need to deal with it. Uh, Rahm Emanuel, whatever his sins, kind of started to deal with it. He didn't go far enough, so we're in the middle of that. The state hasn't dealt with it at all. If that's what it takes to get us out of this hole, maybe it's worth a look. All right, let's deal with some Cook County headlines. Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle says she plans to run for re-election in 2022, reversing previous statements that she'd step down after this term. There's a $701 million debt in the county health system. What is going on there? Transgender individuals in Cook County will now have an easier time using public restrooms, and Cook County property owners will be getting tax bills next month. And if you're in the northern or central part of the county, you may see a big spike. Derek Blakely, why is Tony Preckland going to run for a third term as Cook County Board President when she previously said this was it? Well, I mean, if you've spent any time around politicians, you know, uh, you know, they, they retire uh, very <laughs> seldom and very. Uh, well, Ed Burke said uh, famously with once. On it. Yeah, exactly. You're either taken out uh, in a gurney or taken out in uh, in a police car. You know, when you're leaving city council. And you know, if she was about to sign on for another four years to run Chicago, uh, why wouldn't you think she would want to extend her tenure at the county board? She she has a complete control over the county board. Uh, she helped defeat three commissioners in the, in the last round of elections. She has more power there than ever, and it's a safe seat. I mean, she's not going to be challenged inside the party, and, and of course, Republicans don't have the strength to, to challenge her in Cook County anyway. Also, she probably doesn't want to be a lame duck when she you know, has initiatives she wants to get through. But you know, Robert Dole once said, someone asked him why he was running for vice president, his response was, it's an inside job with no heavy lifting. That's where Tony Preckwinkle is right now on the county board. But is it also a message to Mayor Lori Lightfoot saying, I'm, I'm not going anywhere? Mm, maybe. It could be. It could be. It also, she probably has the sting of the losing the election is worn off. And so that, that's when you want to stay in the job after you've lost. You like where you're at? you continue with you it. You know, Paris also saying you're going to run in three years doesn't mean you are. Uh, it just it just preserves you as a viable person. Right. She had, a, fun, she had a fundraiser. It, she's raising yeah, it. She's people, doing all the people things. People think that, you're going away. They don't give you any respect. You need to do this just to keep <laughs> your people in line. And so, she did say running for mayor kind of reminded her of what she liked about the work that she's doing, and she thinks she has a lot more to do at the county. I asked her, what do you think happens to the county if you're not running it anymore? And she just said, I think I could do more good work. One of the problems the county faces right now is the health system that is hundreds of millions in dollars in debt. What is going on there? So the county's independent inspector general, Pat Blanchard, put out a report last week saying that at the end of the 2018 fiscal year, the Cook County Health and Hospital System had a $701 million liability and that they were paying old debt with new money that they were getting from the state and that that liability was growing to such a point that it could be a problem and that taxpayers might have to jump in to kind of rescue the hospital system. The hospital system says this is a misrepresentation, that their county care program, which is a Medicaid managed care program, is strong and that they will fully respond to Blanchard's report next month. But commissioners on the Cook County Board are furious, saying, you know, we tried to pass a beverage tax and folks came and tried to burn down the boardroom. We can't come in and rescue the hospital system. So they're saying it's just a, a matter of interpreting the numbers? Yes. 
And what happens if the inspector general is right? Does that mean the county's going to have to come forward with a bunch of new taxes to fix this? It could be. I mean, what Preckwinkle and the hospital system say is, you know, a lot of this has to do with the schedules of the state paying us and also when bills clear, when bills are clean, we pay them within 30 days. But I'm excited to see the, the hospital's detailed accounting of when they pay the bills and when those new charges come up. All right. Uh, speaking of problems at the county, if uh, you live in certain areas, your property taxes are going to go way up. Greg Hines, is this a result of Joe Barrios' final assessment making the system fair and equitable? Uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, I think it has more to do with, uh, with where property values are rising. Uh, this, the, the, each part of the, there's, the county's divided into thirds, and each part is, is reassessed every, every three years. In this case, it was the city of Chicago. And what they found is, duh, property values downtown on the north side, northwest side are going up. Property values on the south side are, are pretty weak. So guess where the big, where the big increases are? Um, it's difficult for homeowners. The average increase on the north side and uh, uh, on the northern, northern, northern two-thirds of the city is about 11.5% in one year, that's a real bite, but that's the way the property tax system is supposed to work. If your house is worth more, you pay more, but it's really hard to come, of, come up with because you're not gonna sell your house to pay the bill, you gotta come up with the cash somehow. As a result, you have a lot of angry homeowners and now Fritz Kage, the new assessor, is uh, calling on commissioners to help him out with some staff because he can't handle all this load. Right, we've had appeals go up and up and up as people get more and more angry about those bills. Um, assessor Kage kind of called around to all the Cook County Board and said, hey, could you lend some people for the month of July and August when we so bills go out on July 1st you can actually check them now at the Cook County Treasurer's website um, but they're gonna start getting angry calls July and August and they're saying we're short staffed as it is commissioners could you lend a couple people uh, a lot of commissioners were like absolutely not and also the inspector general was like that's improper transferring of employees over He's going to need some phone bankers. I guess All so. right, let's move on to some other news. Governor J.B. Pritzker signs Illinois' legal recreational marijuana bill into law, and a waitress spits on Eric Trump, allegedly, during his <laughs> visit to Fulton Market Cocktail Lounge, the spit spat. All right, so, so what do we need to know about uh, marijuana now, Derek Blakely, now that it's signed into law? What are the next steps? Well, the next steps is actually to start selling marijuana <laughs> January 1st. And of course, uh, for the state to start uh, collecting on some of the license fees. Uh, I'm kind of wary of some of these uh, revenue uh, projections. They've already been reduced a bit. Um, uh, the pattern in other states has been that uh, the ramp up is kind of slow, uh, maybe three or four years out uh, before you really get uh, kind of the mother load. And the other thing is um, the economics of this are kind of strange to me because you know you've got the state taking a bite uh, you've got uh, uh, the growers the distributors all uh, you know taking their cost out and you know the guy on the street corner the weed man is always going to be cheaper yeah because he doesn't pay any taxes right Cheryl but isn't Oregon the, the issue with Oregon they've overgrown it so much that it has become really cheap they have is more it, supply than right. demand so well, I, think, I think the question here the elephant in the room here isn't isn't the money I mean we'll get what we get the, 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 the long-term implications on health and, and public safety, I think, is what we're going to have to watch. I mean, it's been legalized in places like Oregon right. and, uh, and, uh, Colorado, and Colorado, Colorado, but that's not the same as a big city like Chicago. We don't know quite how this is all going to play out. Well, what is the regulatory body? I mean, there's a Liquor Control Commission that, that right. regulates alcohol. What, what is there for marijuana? Anybody? There isn't. No one really knows the answer to that. And they have in Colorado had some experience in some of the other states where it's been legalized with increased traffic accidents right. and law enforcement's quite worried because they don't really have a good way to measure uh, when someone is high on pot. They, Cheryl, they have to have, they have to take a blood test in order to do that actually to do it correctly. Right. That's the problem. Right. That's they're invasive. Not doing that on, at the so they're not no right. they're not going to do that. So it's going to be really difficult. It's also uh, like where do you put the dispensaries? You know, who gets them? Who, how do you license that? How do you how do you regulate that? Um, there's a lot of problems that can evolve. Man, I don't know. This. Don't you think uh, kids high on, on scooters uh, is, is a great <laughs> oh, way to spend your life? Oh, oh boy, more scooter be, accidents. If we're talking about law enforcement, the other part of this is expungement. The 1.3 right. right. million people who have been arrested and convicted of marijuana-related offenses since the 70s. It's going to be a huge lift, especially in Cook County, to start wiping clean a lot of those records. Cheryl, what about professional athletes? Are they, uh, uh, now that it's legal in Illinois, can they come when they're passing through town and light up, or does MLB or NFL have 
their own restrictions yeah, that's, on it. That's what they have to work out because I know when they go to Colorado, you know, they can they can toke uh, in Colorado. Um, I think they'll have the same thing here. Um, it's it, it, they don't have an issue with with marijuana. It has the NBA is the only one that has had an issue, has tested it. But overall, that's not the issue that they're worried about more than anything. It's more steroids than it is with with pot. All right, let's move on to sports. On that note, a two-year-old girl struck by an errant foul ball off the bat of a Cubs player suffered a skull fracture, according to the girl's attorney. The Chicago Cubs maintain their lead in the NL Central Division. The Southsiders lose two of three to the Bo Sox, and coaching legend Gene Pingator, the winningest high school basketball coach in state history, dies. Cheryl, uh, what did we learn about that young girl that was struck by the foul ball off the bat of Albert Elmora? She suffered a, a fractured skull. She's had some issues with seizures. Uh, they said she's better at this point, but they'll give another, um, uh, they'll, they'll let us know more in July what's going on with her. But this has been very, very secretive as far as her information about her. Uh, it was Why a lawyer. Why do you think that is? There are some theories, and um, one of the things is litigation could be one of the things that, you know, who, who could they sue? They could sue the Astros. They could sue uh, Major League Baseball. I don't think they'll sue uh, Albert Elmora. Yeah, it was just a foul. I mean, it was a foul ball off of it. It's nothing that he could have controlled. How has he been affected by all this? It's affected him emotionally. He's got two sons. He won't talk about it. He's very, um, he was asked about it just yesterday. Will not talk about it. I don't know if it's his decision or maybe baseball is telling him not to talk about it too because they don't know where this is go f going from here. Is Houston liable? I mean, on your ticket, you mentioned to me, you know, it says, you know, we're not liable for anything that happens here, but their netting doesn't yes. go that far. And that's the problem. The netting went so far, which obviously means that they knew that there was a problem. They didn't take it far enough. So when the White Sox did announce that they're extending it foul pole to foul pole, they're the first ones to do it. The Nationals are going to do it. Major League Baseball has got to take and change it for everybody. When well, they made them do it this, you know, behind the, the plate, they've got to go down to, they do it in Japan. And it's got the Illinois senators involved. Duckworth and Durbin sent a note to Major League Baseball saying, you need to extend the netting at all stadiums. Derek, is this something that you believe all stadiums have to get on? I think it's going to happen eventually. Uh, the question is, whether lawsuits and public pressure are going to force Major League Baseball to take the lead, which they clearly should do. And, and the White Sox have kind of taken the lead in yeah. doing this. Is there fan backlash from fans that say, hey, like, I want to enjoy yeah. the game unencumbered? Well, you know, what? I've sat behind. There, there is no problem with it. Where they get angry about is that they can't get the autographs before the game. They can't get a foul ball. All they have to do is make those roll up, make them roll up before the game, get your autographs, get your baseballs, roll them down for the game. That's Seems all like they have to do. It's, it's a simple thing. All right, let's talk about some action on the field. Craig Kimbrell made his debut as closer for the Cubs. How did he do? It was an interesting, I mean, it was a great ovation. It was similar to what we saw in 2016 when Tra Chapman came in. It was, he had a huge ovation from the moment he walked out. It was an interesting uh, inning. Uh, he got two outs, then he gave up a double, then he had a walk. He runs in first and third, first and second with uh, the two outs. And then he, uh, there was a ground ball that he should have covered first base. He didn't. Thankfully, Anthony Rizzo grabbed the ball and dove for first base Sprinted. to get the third out. I mean, it was like, but it was, you know, it was something that the Cubs had been hoping would happen to have this closer at this point because they had issues with closing the last uh, few months. And finally, tell us about Gene Pingator, the coach at St. Joe's, longtime coach. He died this week. What kind of legacy does he leave? He, le he leaves the legacy of being the best high school basketball coach in this state. No doubt about it. He was ready to prepare for a 51st season. You know, he was still coaching at 82 years old. And everyone knows that there's one particular player that he coached. Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas, a Hall of Famer. And, you know, that says a lot about him. And, you know, players came out of there doing very well. I mean, he's just one of those coaches that <clears throat> cared about the players. He wasn't easy, but he cared about his players. All right, before we go, Derek Blakely, you had a, a big uh, announcement a couple weeks ago. Yesterday was your last day at CBS2. You've been a, a fixture in this market. Uh, one of our favorite like guests. Like a lamppost? You like, no, uh, yeah, like a, lamp, <laughs> like a very 82. good looking lamppost. 82. A very good looking lamppost. Uh, what are the highlights in your mind of, of the things that you've covered in, in, in your career? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a long list, but. Um, Certainly uh, in Chicago, Harold Washington's election is up there. Lori Lightfoot's election is up there. I mean, uh, I, 
if there's one thing I regret is I'm not going to be around to watch closely the changes she is trying to make. Um, because Chicago has changed. I mean, her election proved that the electorate has changed and is fed up with some of the things that have been taken as a standard operating practice in the town for years. You spent a lot of years uh, overseas. You reported out of the out of the London Bureau. Um, what, what, what are the other sort of memories that you take with you? Uh, I covered the Ethiopian famine in the 80s, which is uh, just uh, gut-wrenching uh, to see some of these uh, scenes of widespread starvation brought on by civil war. Um, I, uh, uh, I was in Beirut uh, during uh, the civil war there, which was very scary, especially when they were <laughs> kidnapping folks. Um, so those were some of the, the things overseas, and a lot of feature stories I enjoyed. Well, it's been an amazing career. We've enjoyed watching you. We've enjoyed having you here. And we do totally hope you stick around in some capacity and, and lend your expertise to what happens in Chicago going forward. I'm a born and bred Chicagoan. I'm not going anywhere. Yes, you are. <laughs> all right. Derek Blakely, Greg Hines, A.D. Quigg, Cheryl Ray Stout, my thanks to all of you. My thanks to you for watching. And we will continue this conversation online in our web extra video. And we'll see you on the next edition of the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Cheryl, um, what about the White Sox? Uh, they kind of lost two or three to the Boston Red Sox. They cannot get to that 500 mark. They have a problem with their starting pitching.